one of the kind of crimes of the L and D space, in my opinion, is the fact that we push content at people. You know, e learning, regardless of how interactive we try and make it, fundamentally is about putting some kind of content in front of the learner and hoping they learn it. And if they already know it, we don't care. We're still going to give it to them. And if they struggle with it, we don't care because we can't do anything about that. So by using questions at the heart of the learning process, we can solve two problems in one. We can figure out, do you already know this? In which case, why would we make you sit through this three-minute video? And we're talking at a very granular level here. This isn't simply saying, oh, you're pretty good at project management, therefore we won't send you on a project management course. Yeah. The, the goal is within project management, let's try and figure out the things that you already know and are good at, and in which case we won't teach you those very specific things, but where you have a gap or a misconception, then let's focus in on those things. So, so one part is optimizing through questions, optimizing your time to help you learn the things that are important. Secondly, through those same questions, collect evidence that you've actually learned something. One of the other crimes, I think, in our content-centric way of teaching is that historically our metrics have all been transactional. Someone completed a course. Mm -hmm someone took this amount of time surely what matters is we're in the business of building capability did we succeed in doing that yeah. and so you get kind of a twofer from that basic concept of using questions as a fundamental element of the teaching process got it well i have to confess that i've definitely been an L&D criminal myself uh, in in the past so <laughs> we all I, have I think, uh... we all have and, and that's and that's what got me on this journey i am unfortunately you know, without bringing religion into this, I'm a bit like the L&D equivalent of the born again Christian, because I realize how badly we used to do some things. And it's like, OMG. Yeah. Right. How did I not know this? No, I think there's there. I think there, this is a sense that's broadly shared within our community as well. And I've got I've got data to to, to sort of prove that. Um, I actually took a course on your system this week since you and I talked, actually, um, I thought I'd go check it out. Um, it was a course that's free on your website on COVID-19. Um, and it was a really cool experience. And, and it's a really good way to get a feel, I think, for, for what the technology does and how it works. First of all, I was surprised that there were some pretty fundamental things that I didn't know. And I, and I thought I was on top of all this. Um, but it's really apparent as you go through. And I, I mean, it was basically a topic where I would say, I, you know, I have a pretty good <laughs> mastery of the level that you're yeah. teaching at anyway, because because I've been reading the newspapers, right? Um, and um, But what was sort of interesting to me was uh, the macro level, like before I started, and then again and again throughout the sort of various prompts, um, uh, you know, you were asking me, um, you were asking me about my confidence. I had to sort of Yes. To, to sort of not only answer the answer the question, but also sort of give a level of confidence. Um, what, what's the purpose of that? Is that part of how the engine establishes um, uh, my degree of capability? It is, and again, it's it's a bit like the question thing in that we're solving several problems at the same time. So we, as you pointed out, we make use of confidence extensively, whereas in a, in a typical way of teaching, if you are collecting feedback from the student, usually you're just trying to determine, have they, do they understand this? Have they learned something? Can they answer this question correctly? What most platforms fail to do is the thing that a tutor would do in real world, in, in the real world, which is the tutor has the ability to look you in the eyes and say, I know you gave me the right answer, but I'm not actually sure you really know it. Right. I think maybe you guessed that. Yeah. And so we introduced, and we kind of pioneered the idea of using confidence, and we use it in two ways. So one is, um, as you pointed out, at a meta level, at a macro level, when you're about to start studying something, we ask you, how good do you think you are about this? How well do you think you know this COVID stuff? Are you a beginner? Are you an expert? Now, we don't take that as gospel, but it, it helps prime 
the way that our the what we call the adaptive engine, the thing that ultimately makes the decisions about what you should study, it helps prime that engine to change its behavior. Because one of the things that we found is that these questions are great, but if you are a novice and we start asking you lots of questions, that can be quite frustrating. I know nothing about COVID. How do you expect me to even answer this? So we want to take away that. If you think you know it, then let us tell us you think you know it, and we will try and get you out of here as quickly as you can. Um, but the other way we use confidence is for individual questions, we ask you to self-assess how well do you think you performed. So if you answer something, do you really think you know this or are you somewhat guessing? And that does two things in itself. One is it causes you to pause and reflect. Yeah. And again, if you look at the Salas paper and others, self-reflection is just a fantastic learning activity. And so we force that to happen. We're injecting that into the process. But then also, that is a really valuable data point because if someone gets a question wrong, then clearly it's there's a big difference if they kind of thought they were going to get it wrong versus they thought they knew this. And so the adaptive engine is going to change its behavior if you are what we call unconsciously incompetent, if you think you know something, right. which everybody does, right? We all hold misconceptions. It's the curse of being human. There is, you know, there's a Again, for anybody who wants to dig into this more, it's kind of reached the mainstream recently. This is Dunning-Kruger research yep. um, that um, everybody, the worse you are at something, generally the better you think you are at it. Yep. Um, and it must, be, it must have been a useful survival trait on the savannah 300,000 years ago. But these days, it's really difficult. You do not want the pilot thinking that they know how to do something and making it up as they go along. Um, likewise, you don't want your salesperson making stuff up in front of the client thinking that it's the right answer, right? And, and again, one of the topics that's maybe useful to bring up here is through these questions and through this self-confidence and all the other things, we're not trying to trick the learner and we're not trying to somehow you know, lead them down a path where they don't want to go. We're trying to help them realize and become self-aware Oh, actually, I don't know that. I thought I did. And then have the system gently remediate for that and help build their confidence and build their competence so that by the end of it, they are much more likely to apply it on the job rather than simply, I've now seen an hour's worth of content. You know, Done. did I actually learn anything? Yeah, it was kind of really, uh, it was interesting going through the experience. I mean, there is a lot of research on that just thinking about learning, like, like, you said yep. reflecting on the content that you've learned, but also thinking about the, your own process of learning is really an accelerator for for brain plasticity, and and that seems to be a, a good sort of practice. And you can really feel that happening because this was a topic that was quite, you know, relatively high level, and I felt fairly confident on. Um, there was, uh, I suspect, you know, my experience. There was a lot of interrogation of me. And yep. not a lot of new content. And I'm sure if it was kind of like a brand new field, that the sort of balance of those things would have been different. But also, you know, I'm getting, I think you call them probes. There is different ways yes. of interrogating me to understand my level of knowledge. Can you talk about this, this idea of probes and how they work? Yes. So uh, this goes back to the formative assessment, the, the teaching through asking questions. Uh, and the way that we build content or our clients build content um, is that it is still using the same content you would normally find in an e-learning program. So I suppose we should have said that right up front. This is, to all intents and purposes, e-learning. It is self-paced yeah. learning, digital content yeah. um, of any format, video, slides, you know, so the, the, the medium is, doesn't really matter. Um, but it's designed to be used in a self-paced way, um, and probes are at the heart of that. So if you were doing good course design, you would identify, you know, what business problem are we trying to solve? What are the performance outcomes that we're looking for? Where do we believe the gaps are? Therefore, let us build out our learning objectives. What are the things that we want people to learn as a result of this course? Whether it's 
to do something or to know something. Um, and then associated with, <clears throat> excuse me, associated with those learning play, uh, objectives play would to. be the con. I'm good. I think for the moment okay. I will I'll stop and try it in a moment. Okay. Um, so associated with those learning objectives are the content that you would normally put in any kind of course. But then the key differentiator are these probes. So associated with every single granular learning objective are the probes. How would you know if someone was proficient about this thing? And that could be something as simple as a multiple choice question, or it could be something as complex as execute this 3D simulation of this process to demonstrate that you really know how to do it. Ultimately, we don't care what the probe is, as long as we are gathering information about not only the learner's level of competence, can they do something, but how confident are they in their ability to do that. And the system will um, ha uses those probes to determine how to navigate through the content. So in your case, as you were responding to those probes, if you're answering confidently and correctly and doing that quickly, then fantastic. Mm. We're going to get you out of there as quickly as you can. Mm. If, you, if you're doing that for the first you know, 15 minutes of the course and suddenly you start to struggle, then the behavior of the algorithm is going to change. It's going to begin to emphasize the content more. It's going to look at your responses, try and help you learn something. And if you're struggling still, then that's a really interesting thing because the system isn't magic. It's, it's not a mind reader. It can't know exactly why you're struggling, and it can only use the content that it's got. Yeah. But one of the things we do in that scenario is that's a really useful data point. So we capture that and feed that back to whoever developed the content to say, here's a learner that's really struggling with this. And ideally, not a learner, maybe half the learners so far are really struggling to understand this particular thing. Maybe you need to tweak the content. Right. So th there's a couple of things. Formative assessments are sometimes used to help people decide which content to engage with, like um, uh, what career to do or kind of what learning to take, yep. you know, which, which uh, part of the curriculum to sort of dive into. But you operate sort of at a deeper level than that. You're, you're, you operate, once I've decided that this is a course I'm going to interact with, this is where your tool kicks in, I think. Is that correct? Correct, yes. At, at least as it stands right now, okay. um, our job is not to decide whether you ought to study project management or not. Our job is once you've decided that project management is for you, whether that's as part of a career discussion or because you are a project manager and you've just had a performance review or it's just something you're interested in, once you start studying it, our job is to get you to competency as quickly as we can and to get you to the highest level of competency. So we want to optimize your learning path at a very granular level. And by that, I mean literally minute to minute. So this isn't, should I study project management 101 versus 102? It's, you know, I'm learning about a risk register do I understand what a risk register is? What makes up a risk register? Yeah. How would I complete one if I needed to? What's, what are the things that should be and should not be in a risk register? And so at a very granular task level, we're trying to make determinations about, yep, you're good to go on this, but actually you think it's this and actually it's not. It's this. Let's help you try and overcome that and remediate for it. Now, as you say, you can, you absolutely can use formative assessment at that macro level. And one of the things that we've been studying over the last few years is, um, particularly in those edge cases, you know, if, if you are Chris and you're taking that COVID course mm. and you're just knocking it out of the park, does it really make sense for you to even continue and complete the course? Now, in a traditional L&D environment, completion is everything. But really, does it matter? Wouldn't you be better maybe just getting out of there now or even studying something that's more advanced that might help you move forward or conversely 
if you get a third of the way in and you are really struggling, yeah. 